please stand by <clears throat> until uh, we wait for other participants to join. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from Buenos Aires. Today is October 14, <clears throat> 2020. My name is Leandro Pasarela. I'm a tax lawyer and professor of income taxation at UTDT's Masters of Tax Law program. I'm with Professor Selena Valls. Hello, Selena. Hello, Leandro. Hello, everyone. We, we are happy to be back. We are our eighth dialogue within the UTDT Global Tax Talks. Leandro, could you please remind which is the purpose of these talks? Yes, uh, definitely. Following it, uh, Universidad Torquato de Tela's mottos of academic excellence, pluralism, and equal opportunity, UTDT Global Tax Talks is a platform fostering an interdisciplinary dialogue among scholars and faculty members from all continents on a single uh, <clears throat> hard tax topic. Based on a common questionnaire, Tax law professors, economists, and political scientists are sharing their views on the same issue, offering the audience a, a comprehensive analysis. In its first edition, UTDT Global Tax Talks is covering the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on the international tax system. So far, we have a roster of <clears throat> 10 recognized scholars. We can anticipate that there will be three more dialogues after we end up with uh, Professor Shu in, in, in a few weeks. Uh, and we will have talks with OECD, UN, and IMF tax policy makers uh, in the global tax talks as well. Uh, so far, we are uh, covering <clears throat> most of the part of the uh, country, of the, I'm sorry, of the world, not the country, of the world. We have spoken uh, with people from North America, from Europe, from Africa, India, and now it is the time to go to Southeast Asia, China, and uh, Australia. Today, we have the pleasure of speaking with Professor Yang Shu. Welcome, Professor Yang Shu. Yang Shu is Associate Professor in the School of Taxation and Business Law at the University of New South Wales. Prior to joining the school in September 2019, she was an associate professor in the Faculty of Law at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. She was awarded a Fulbright Senior Research Scholarship and a Hong Kong Council Research Grant. She was invited as a visiting fellow at Columbia Law School in 2014 to conduct a research project, a project on tax reform, the rule of law and representative government. She has held a number of international academic scholarship at institutions which include the University of Cambridge, New York University, the University of Melbourne, and in the University of South Wales. She has published in wide range of international journals, presented paper at high level international and regional conferences, made presentation on invitation from prominent international bodies, including the Australian, Australian Commonwealth Treasury, and is often invited to act as a referee for highly ranking law journals and academic books. 
In 2017, she was invited as a panelist at the International Fiscal Association Annual Congress seminar series on international indirect taxation. Her research interests include comparative, comparative tax law and policy, international taxation, history of tax law, and uh, environment taxation. Professor Yang Xu, welcome to the UTD Global Tax Talks. Thank you very much, Selena. Uh, thank you very much for the kind uh, introduction. And so thank you um, again. And also thank you, Professor Passarella, uh, for the very kind invitation. Um, I'm honored uh, to be here and uh, to meet colleagues uh, uh, from another part of Southern Hemisphere. So thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Yang. Thank you, Professor Xu, for being with us. Uh, it will be it is a great, a great pleasure to expand our uh, dialogues with people like yourself and uh, to, to, to have uh, the possibility of uh, having your point of view on, on the, the questions that we have. But before we go to the questionnaire, let me make a brief introduction. As we all know, in December 2019, almost a year ago, a minuscule life form, a coronavirus, appeared on our human world. Since then, it has silently spread using human beings and their advances in technology as means of transportation. Nowadays, coronavirus is an uninvited guest in our lives and is everywhere, and human beings cannot see it or detect it before its unsettling presence becomes real, once it has already infected human beings, jeopardizing their lives. Governments initially reacted to the virus spread requesting us or directly requiring us to retreat to our homes, disrupting our normal lives. Borders were closed, planes were grounded. We cannot move far from our places of residence, and if we do, in many cases, we are required to comply with a preventive quarantine. We live very much as if we were characters of a science fiction book. Until an effective vaccine is designed to allow us to get back to normal, but the pandemic fades away naturally, hopefully. Human beings will continue to be pushed <clears throat> sorry, to transform our lifestyles. This transformation includes the way in which we do business. Social distancing is now the rule and electronic commerce is widespread. Everything is delivered to our doors or screens and this behavior will likely remain once we learn to coexist with the pandemic. If we change the way we do business, this for sure has tax implications. So far governments have used tactics and tools already known to them to deal with this pandemic's effects on their country's economies and their long-term results are uncertain. In UTDT Global Tax Talks, we are discussing various tax issues derived from the challenges that COVID-19 poses to human beings' economic relations and how states could deal with them effectively to continue generating revenues to provide the essential services that human beings expect to receive from them. For that purpose, Selena and I have prepared a set of questions that was sent to the speakers in anticipation to our dialogues. We don't know their answers yet, but we will listen to them very attentively to provide our conclusions. Now, probably it will be in December. If, having said that, our first question, Professor Shu, are the following. During the lockdown, MNEs have adapted rapidly some of their activities in other countries may have been performed without the need in, of any local presence. Home office has become the rule and it may no longer be necessary to commute so often again. Assuming that the international tax system continues to be based on the source versus residence distinction, should the concept of PE be revisited and, and redefined? How? Do you think that these changes should apply exceptionally to certain industries or should they become the general rule? What are your views? Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, so I just uh, started sharing my screen. Can I see my screen, my slides? Okay, um, thank you. So I will start uh, um, with uh, the first question. Okay, right. Um, yeah, all are very good uh, questions. Um, I mean, the questions are contained in um, question one. Um, for the first part of uh, question one, I think my answer is um, probably is twofold. Um, a normative analysis uh, would suggest um, the PE concept uh, should be redefined 
or at least developed um, because it has become clear and the concept is not fit for purpose in the 21st century. A positive analysis, however, um, would argue the century old concept is very hard to be completely redefined. On the other hand, the PE concept is under pressure uh, with the rapid um, and digitalization of the economy. And the pandemic um, crisis may further incentivize uh, companies to become technologically um, more innovative and rely more on digital means and to operate a business uh, and deliver goods and services across the borders. This would put more pressure um, on the PE concept and that was developed a century ago. The concept, um, um, especially for people um, doing specialized um, in international taxation, uh, we all know the concept is crucial um, under the current international tax system. It is viewed um, as, a as a mechanism um, to balance competing tax revenue claims um, between the residents and the source uh, jurisdictions. As with the entire construct of the international tax system, the PE concept uh, um, is what one commentator calls um, a political uh, invention. Um, the concept under the OECD model uh, was created and developed uh, and to protect uh, tax revenue um, interest, um, sorry, uh, to protect the tax revenue from business profits uh, uh, for the residence jurisdiction, uh, usually a capital exporting country. And the concept under the UN model um, contains notable differences. Uh, for example, uh, shorter periods of physical presence of certain activities and um, a limited force of attraction rules um, as a way to reflect um, the contribution made uh, by the source um, country to the production of income. So the fundamental framework of PE created in the early 20th century, um, actually particularly the one in the 1963 draft OECD model, um, remained remarkably unstable until 2017. Uh, except for some tinkering uh, with uh, the relevant article and the commentary. The PE concept uh, before the uh, 2017 model uh, was criticized as being obsolete and poorly suited to the digitalized economy. And most notably, uh, it fails to, um, to capture um, profits um, from economic um, penetration of technology companies in a foreign market. So the concept was, um, um, was indeed outdated. And the other problem with the concept is, uh, um, is, is, um, is it has offered opportunities for the artificial avoidance of, of PE presence, um, harming the taxability um, of business profits in the source and uh, jurisdiction. The 2017 model and the, um, and the MLI and introduced a new um, PE definition. The new definition um, has to some degree uh, served its intended purpose uh, of closing certain loopholes um, that existed uh, in the previous uh, definition. Um, however, um, I think the definition is still inadequate uh, with virtual spaces uh, such as websites uh, facilitate online conclusion of contracts because the revised agency PE rules require an agent uh, to be a person. And moreover, and the, and preparation, the preparatory or auxiliary test and under the new definition could only capture um, some indirect e-commerce such as Amazon, but it couldn't catch and um, cover direct e-commerce such as uh, iTunes, um, meaning the source of taxation of the digital profits um, is in practice uh, limited. So in short, the 2017 um, definition is not sufficient uh, to create a nexus um, for the taxation of profits um, through digital operation of business. Further revision or redefinition, redefi um, I think is, uh, is needed. And the recent uh, discussion and the unilateral measures 
uh, required uh, uh, related to the PE concept uh, indicates uh, a move um, from physical presence to economic uh, um, presence. The OECD BAMS Action 1 final report considers uh, incorporating revenue-based uh, factors and digital factors and the user-based functions into the PE concept. It also considers the profit attribution rules uh, for such a PE. Some jurisdictions, uh, um, for example, Israel, uh, have redefined the PE threshold to deem digital presence or significant economic presence of an entity as constituting a PE, even if the entity does not have for um, phys a physical presence um, in the jurisdiction. And India, yeah, India um, has always been used uh, as an example for, um, for redefin redefinition of the PE concept. And India introduced a significant presence test uh, to its nexus rules uh, with the e-factor from 2018. The UK enacted uh, a diverted uh, profits tax uh, to capture multinational companies and that artificially avoided um, creating British PEs. The UN model um, has uh, pondered uh, expanding the PE definition to include uh, uh, virtual space PEs. Um, although this idea remains uh, somehow a minority view, um, currently it seems uh, the significant economic presence um, approach uh, is the most uh, popular approach to defining taxable nexus uh, for the digitalized uh, economy. And should a revision of the PE definition, whatever it is, um, be applied to the digital sector only? And this is a very good question, an important question. And it is uh, um, a concern of some countries. So for example, uh, the United States has insisted and that any solution negotiated at the OECD and should be system-wide um, rather than digital only. A new standalone PE definition that enables market jurisdictions to claim um, tax revenue of profits attributed to them, or a redefined physical PE concept and that includes the locations uh, where a company has a remote um, but a significant involvement in the economy um, would first apply to digital business. But the problem is the line of differ differentiating between digital and the traditional business, business um, is rather blurred in practice because the traditional business um, has increasingly incorporated the digital means into their um, operation. Another issue I think is, uh, is even if a company with a significant economic presence um, can be considered uh, creating a PE, how to tax profits attributed uh, to, such a, to such a PE? The PE concept uh, does not exist um, in isolation. It is very closely linked to the profit attribution rules. Currently, there was no clear rule on it and the OECD is working on it um, with its pillow one proposal. Many current issues on the interaction between and the PE, um, between PE profit, profit attribution and the transfer pricing uh, may be exacerbated uh, um, by the broadened uh, 2017 um, definition. So I think to sum up um, my answer to question one, um, the current PE um, definition and fails to capture new business, uh, new business models from digitalization that do not rely on physical presence for business. The pandemic um, may reinforce the desire uh, to redefine the concept. A new standalone definition targeting digital business, um, digital, especially ta uh, targeting digital business models, or a redefined general PE concept that uh, um, uh, reflects uh, such models would help address the problem. But the both have a conceptual and the theoretical, so conceptual and the practical um, difficulties that would be um, very difficult to, to resolve. 
So yeah, I think this is uh, the summary of my answer to question one. Yeah. Yes, uh, if I may ask uh, a follow-up question. It sure. seems that uh, <clears throat> the redefinition of the PE concept is subject to, in practical terms, to uh, the cleaning of a lot of unilateral measures that countries have adopted, correct? Yeah, at the moment, uh, a number of unilateral measures uh, have either been proposed or introduced, um, or some countries are considering introducing some unilateral measures. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's why the OECD has been working very hard on pillar one and pillar two, um, so that a unilateral a unilateral consistent approach can be adopted at the international level. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. The next question is uh, related with the first one, and it is read as, as follows. Is the current international tax system designed to attribute tax jurisdiction among states fairly? so that they can generate tax revenue to deal with a situation like the COVID-19 pandemic effectively? Why? If this, if this goal is not achieved with the current system, how could it be attained? Which line of policy should be followed to achieve this goal? Sure, uh, thank you, Selena. Um, as you can already, I have already shown my answer to the first part of this question. So the short answer to the question of um, their attribution of tax jurisdiction um, is probably no. Um, there are many reasons uh, to explain this. And the first and the foremost is, um, I think from the outside, the international tax system was not in, um, invented um, to achieve for a fair balanced revenue attribution between countries, but um, to mitigate double taxation for businesses and to facilitate cross-border trade and investment. There have been criticisms about um, the current international tax system, um, which is a relic um, of an earlier time, um, and which is since uh, the outside uh, uh, sought to uh, mainly protect uh, the interests of wealthy countries. The international um, tax system, um, which consists uh, of tax treaties and uh, domestic tax laws, contains a range of rules that limit or even eliminate tax revenue claims of the source country, often developing countries. Many bilateral tax treaties are based on the OECD model and due to its wide influence. The model was developed and shaped by wealthy jurisdictions. The UN model has a sort to reflect physical interests of developing countries, um, but it is not as influential and widely applied um, as the OECD model. In general, and in comparison to the UN model, the OECD model um, favors the residence uh, country. Um, and, and very often, um, as we can see, the OECD model requires the source country um, to give up some or all of its taxing rights on certain um, categories of income earned by residents uh, of the other treaty country. The PE article and its related profit uh, attribution rules are a very good example. And the PE concept requires um, physical presence of an entity for a substantial period of time, a year in 12 months uh, in the source country, excludes a wide scope of activities uh, from being considered uh, constituting a PE and limits the source of taxation of business profits and to only those um, um, attributed uh, to the PE. The UN model contains important differences uh, uh, such as uh, mentioned very briefly um, for the previous uh, question, and such as a lower PE thresholds, uh, nearly six month requirement uh, for construction PEs uh, and the fewer ex exclusions um, for the purpose of for protecting the source countries uh, and tax revenue. The 2017 revised PE definition under the OECD model lowers the PE threshold, which would in principle um, mean an increased tax revenue um, for the source country. However, um, with the current um, profit attribution rules, 
And the taxable amount, uh, I think um, after the PE uh, definition uh, revised in 2017, the taxable amount would be still would be limited for the source country to only the earnings calculated according to the arms length principle. So for many developing countries, the 2017 definition um, may not generate a sufficient tax re revenue. Moreover, um, the definition may burden tax administration and uh, the uncertainties uh, may affect needed uh, foreign direct investment. And also, um, despite a general, a general support uh, from um, many developing countries uh, like India and China, um, and practices uh, relating to, uh, to service, uh, service PEs in some of these uh, countries uh, as a means um, to protect, uh, to prevent uh, abuse of PE rules uh, are not reflected uh, in the BAPS uh, project. Um, another good example is uh, the taxation of investment income, uh, such as uh, including dividends, interest, and uh, capital gains. And the OECD model um, prescribes specific caps or maximum withholding rates um, for the three types of investment income, uh, including a zero rate on royalties. Apparently, um, the lower the rates and the less the tax revenue that the source country um, can collect. And there are further limitations under the OECD model. So for example, a uh, residence country is given exclusive rights uh, to tax capital gains uh, from transfer of a property other than immovable property or movable property forming part of business profits of PEs, and such as shares in a source country company. The UN model, however, allows source taxation from transfer of the shares in non land rich companies in the source jurisdiction. So in practice, um, I think developing countries often somehow suffer revenue loss um, from indirect uh, transfers of shares in source country companies by non-resident investors. Um, here is an example, and this um, shows the use of offshore uh, holding structure uh, to, invest, uh, to invest in and exit um, from the source country market and this, uh, the use of this kind of uh, holding structure uh, has enabled the non-resident investors uh, to gain not only substantial profits, uh, but also gain them uh, with no or low tax costs. And this is the case uh, in China, India, Peru, and a few other uh, developing countries. And this slide shows uh, a typical offshore indirect disposal structure uh, from a real case in China in 2012. And it was until very, uh, a very recent um, OECD publication and that those countries practice uh, in taxing capital gains um, from offshore and share disposal um, had been viewed uh, as a controversial. Um, the rapid developer, um, rapid development of uh, the digitalized economy um, will exacerbate um, um, the imbalanced tax revenue attribution between developed and the developing countries. And somehow ironically, um, but uh, illuminatingly, um, the head of tax uh, for the OECD um, said uh, the Europeans uh, have experienced uh, um, with what it is likely to be a developing country in viewing how the ability of technology companies to avoid the PE worsened revenue shift. This observation implies um, that the developing countries have been suffering from revenue loss and from abuse of the PE concept and other international tax rules um, by multinationals. Many of poor countries rely heavily on corporate tax revenue, um, which contributes uh, on average um, 20% of total um, tax revenue compared with eight um, to 10% um, for developed countries. And these countries uh, are often the most vulnerable to tax avoidance um, by multinationals. And the BAPS project um, was meant to um, tackle uh, serious tax avoidance. 
um, but uh, the risks and the challenges uh, faced by developing countries in this area um, are significant, uh, not least um, with the lack of uh, information, um, the lack of necessary uh, legislative measures um, to address that, um, the lack of uncertainty and the sufficient personnel um, to implement uh, very complicated rules and the gaps in um, administrative um, resources uh, um, as compared to um, developed countries. And challenges from, um, digital, from, the, from the digitalized economy um, would put, put developing countries in an even more vulnerable um, position um, in preventing base erosion and the profit uh, and shifting. So um, also um, revenue challenges um, from COVID-19 um, for developing countries, um, particularly those uh, low income countries uh, could be enormous. Um, evidently um, the outcome um, contradicts uh, um, international tax justice. So how to achieve a fair attribution of tax jurisdiction among countries? And there have been a number of ideas and proposals. And some suggest uh, um, developed countries uh, should transfer, should share um, tax revenue uh, with developing countries um, to compensate um, their loss of tax base and the cost of sharing information about investors uh, from the developed countries. And, and some argue um, for and some argue for a reshape um, of the current international tax system. Um, perhaps uh, to perhaps too um, may be seen um, as a measure of um, um, may be seen as a measure of developing a fairer and more stable attribution of tax revenue among countries, um, which is a major agenda on redefining um, a PE threshold um, for the digitalized economy and devising profits attribution rules for such a PE and adoption of um, um, minimum tax rates um, to combine tax competition. Um, however, um, some commentators worry that uh, the OECD proposals uh, will bring little, uh, if any, in a timely and uh, effective way um, to developing countries uh, where the amount for public expenditure on healthcare um, are to be significant uh, um, in the next uh, few years. Personally, I would argue um, for more participation by developing countries uh, in rulemaking and increased uh, uh, information exchange and the transparency on the part of developed countries and then making the UN, the United Nations, a more preeminent and the key body in moving forward the global just and tax justice um, for the international tax system. Um, we know um, the OECD has been a premier organization for shaping and developing um, international tax rules. Uh, although all members formally, um, uh, all members of the inclusive framework, and um, um, all these members formally participate on an equal footing, they do not um, in practice uh, um, because of several uh, reasons. Uh, including um, um, the imbalanced bargaining power um, between rich and poor countries. For creating a more just global tax system, it is very important to establish a mechanism that allows developing countries to participate equally in developing international tax rules. Um, it is in a world um, that multinationals can freely choose among um, many investment locations, countries would have to face a dilemma. And that is, um, they attempt um, to, um, to tax foreign investors um, to get revenue, um, but they also worry about driving investors uh, to other countries by so doing. A global body um, that coordinates a broad um, a multilateral um, initiative for and provides some surveillance on countries' uh, handling matters could help um, and protect the tax revenue and prevent um, the risk to the bottom um, um, tax competition. 
And the United Nations, um, the United Nations uh, should be such a body. And the pan pandemic um, could offer a very good opportunity and to think about the role of the UN and in international tax justice. Um, so the final part is just a, a bit uh, of my personal thinking. Um, thank you very much. Yeah, and that's all. Thank you, Professor Shu. I just wanted to <clears throat> uh, understand. So with these two last two bullet points, uh, the <clears throat> um, you think that this would be uh, the path to, to take to have the global tax system remade to serve the, uh, the, the base of the global uh, economic pyramid, correct? Um, are you uh, saying um, the, current, uh, the current round of international tax reform is uh, to serve for, I'm not very oh. sure about, uh, yeah. My, my question, okay, what I, want, what I wanted to know is whether you think that uh, with these ideas, these, uh, the, the several ideas and your personal view, uh, this <clears throat> is the way to follow or, or, or a path to, uh, to have the global tax system serve the base of the global economic pyramid, okay, so the poorer people. Yes, yeah, 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 I got it. Thank you very much. Um, to be honest, um, I'm not very sure about the final outcome um, because all the proposals here are ideas and they do have all merits. And then the thing is, um, especially in practice, we can have wonderful ideas but then once these ideas uh, are to be implemented, uh, probably most very often um, we, we, we really sometimes we just couldn't say um, the intended outcomes. So there would be a gap um, between, between rules, between law, between ideas on paper and uh, ideas implementation in practice. So this is the first thing. The second thing is, uh, um, within the current uh, uh, international system in general, not just international tax system um, itself, within the current international system in general, um, many people have argued for the uh, increased bargaining power of developing countries. The thing is for international negotiation uh, or for, for example, international tax rules, and these rules uh, are very critical to every country because they directly relate to tax revenue interest. And how we can say compromise? How can we reach a compromise? How can we reach our consensus? I think this is, a, this is really a big uh, question mark. Um, and we need to come up with, uh, with ideas and with solutions and with, even with some breakthrough um, mechanisms, yeah. Um, but you. I think it's, it's, it's hard. Um, we yeah. recognize that there is a problem with uh, attribution of tax jurisdiction um, currently between um, developed and the developing countries. But mm -hmm. how can we move forward? Um, this uh, is uh, something um, we need to solve, yeah. Well, going, continuing with our questionnaire with question number three, which I think it has uh, some connection with with yeah. what uh, you, you are uh, saying right now. The question now is whether the pandemic is an opportunity to shift the current international tax system to set aside the concepts of source and residence. And, but the question is which substitute we should use afterwards and why? And in, yeah. in, in all this analysis, what is the role of digital services taxes in this shift? Yeah. Uh, and, yeah. and, and if I may add is, uh, whether developed countries would be willing to make such a shift. What are your views? Thank you very much. Wonderful questions. Thank you. Um, all these uh, um, questions are related to the, to the fundamental structure of the current international tax system. And that is uh, the dichotomy between, uh, between residents and the uh, source. 
And the two concepts are, are entrenched in bilateral tax treaties uh, and also incorporated into the domestic laws. Um, all people who learn or practice uh, international taxation start with the concepts. Under the tax treaties, uh, the dogma of attributing and tax revenue between source and the residence is applied uh, and to shift uh, tax revenue from source and to residents uh, via limiting or eliminating source uh, taxation claims. The pandemic has uh, um, in, impacted uh, on the dynamic of source and the residence determination um, because of a temporary relocation of business and employees in a place rather than in the place that would have been without the, the pandemic. So the pandemic, I think, probably may offer uh, an opportunity for countries to rethink um, which country should be entitled um, to the revenue derived from source and uh, residents. Um, in the current round of international tax reform negotiation, um, many proposals uh, have discussed uh, how to attribute uh, um, tax jurisdiction among countries uh, in the modern economy. It's very difficult uh, to reach a consensus uh, on a particular division or attribution um, because of a different interests um, out of national welfare um, concerns. And I think it's even harder um, to theoretically justify um, a particular division. And the existing um, distinction of source and the residence um, has led to many disputes in practice um, because uh, characterization of them will have huge impacts uh, um, on taxpayers' uh, tax uh, liability beyond a single um, jurisdiction. So that's the problem with the existing um, distinction. Do we have all other options uh, uh, except for uh, residence and the source? Uh, I think that yes, um, because the concepts of a source and uh, residence only represent uh, the most uh, uh, widely applied uh, base uh, for tax uh, jurisdiction. And, and they are not the only basis. And taxation can be levied uh, at the place of company shareholders, uh, um, um, the location of customers, uh, market jurisdictions, and the place where users of goods and services are located, and the place where a company's factors of production are present. At the moment, uh, um, the idea of digital services and taxes uh, has attracted uh, uh, wide attention. And the essence of the taxes um, is to override uh, tax treaties and the catching among residents who don't need uh, physical PEs um, to earn income in the country. The application means um, some of the income of digital service providers uh, is sourced uh, in the country living um, a DST. Um, some countries have already introduced a DST. Um, um, typical example is France. Um, um, and they introduced a DST um, to tax larger technology companies uh, on their gross revenue above a certain uh, threshold. Um, as we say, user facing um, technology companies uh, uh, such as Facebook, um, Google, and Netflix, and Twitter, and YouTube um, have gained enormous profits. Uh, from their sales of targeted advertisements and, and uh, subscriptions. Um, intermediate companies are providing online markets uh, such as uh, Amazon, eBay, and uh, China's Alibaba um, are also extremely successful uh, in revenue producing. These companies have been um, performing very well uh, in the pandemic. Um, however, the current international tax rules uh, couldn't effectively tax their profits in the countries of users, buyers, or sellers. And so not surprisingly, those countries want to, uh, want to extend their tax rules for fair taxation and fair competition. Um, countries with, uh, host, uh, which host large um, technology companies, and typically the United States, uh, have very clearly rejected uh, the tax um, as it applies only to targeted uh, companies. Uh, and so therefore is uh, uh, selective 
and refunding. Although these countries uh, view the profits of their leaders, and they do not seem to uh, collect them uh, much from uh, their companies. DSTs um, could provide, uh, I think it could provide a basis uh, to think about uh, fundamental changes and that go beyond the concept of for source um, and the concept of for residence. These uh, um, taxes, uh, the digital service uh, and taxes, and if employee users uh, countries as a proxy to attribute uh, and tax jurisdiction, um, which is a meaningful or manageable solution for creating a nexus um, for tax collection because the user's location is immobile. And from an economical perspective, use, uh, using immobile factors uh, to attribute uh, tax jurisdiction um, can reduce uh, um, distorting, um, distortion in locating um, corporate uh, activities um, be hard to avoid and mitigate government's uh, um, incentive for attracting investment activities uh, and through um, tax competition. And one criticism about um, um, the taxes um, is uh, they are imposed uh, not on net income, but on gross revenue um, from a narrow concept of services. Um, this criticism is refuted by those who view uh, DSTs as a means um, of taxing location-specific rents, um, and the DSTs um, are defined, uh, defined um, as directly addressing the question and the difficult question of profits allocation and um, um, collection. Um, to sum up, I think uh, there are, is uh, no dispute and the current international tax system is not fit for purpose. And even after the BAPS, uh, the BAPS one uh, reforms and in the post COVID-19 um, era, DSTs um, can be an appealing choice for countries uh, to quickly impose and um, to raise needed revenue and to reduce government deficit. Then such taxes would be more attractive um, than a global minimum tax and that is promoted by the OECD um, at the moment. Um, why? Um, because it will, uh, for the global minimum tax to implement, and um, it will take years. Um, and also it will take years to say um, revenue effects of the tax. And if it can be agreed upon um, at the international level sometime, um, later this year or next year. Um, so yeah, um, I think this uh, somehow um, is what we are experiencing right now. In terms of compromise by the developed countries, um, for, for especially for taxation of for the digital economy, um, developing countries, uh, I don't think that they necessarily have uh, a same agenda. Um, some countries which host um, um, large technology companies uh, um, probably wouldn't be happy with uh, redefining international tax rules that would make their technology companies uh, um, to pay more taxes or to be subject to uh, increased uh, taxes in, in, in many other countries. Um, and then another group of developed countries who don't have large technology companies would probably want to move forward uh, the current reform agenda. And for developing countries, uh, it's also uh, very interesting to say somehow division. So for example, China, um, China is like uh, the United States is also currently a leader in developing new technologies. So probably from China's own national economic interest perspective, it's not very keen um, to, um, I'm not sure about this, um, but their interests uh, should be different uh, from the, um, in the revenue interests of other developing countries uh, who don't have very competitive technology companies. So come back to the question, whether developing countries uh, would uh, be willing to compromise 
um, it's very difficult to say, but I think they should. Um, I'm going to talk about the, a bit, uh, um, um, some out of the box thinking, uh, which relates to revenue sacrifice or revenue sharing um, by developed countries. Um, this could be viewed as a moral obligation. And also, um, it's not just um, some moral um, ethical requirement on the part of developed countries, um, but also somehow a concern or a matter of self-interest. And so I will end up um, uh, here for, uh, for question three. Um, thank you. Thank you, Professor. Yes, I think that we are in a position to move to the transfer price pricing question, which is the question number three, sorry, the fourth question. Uh, as you know, the, this pandemic affects the multinational intercompany transactions comparability. So the question is, which are the challenges and possible solutions to determine the arm range, the arm length range during this economic downturn? Okay, yeah, uh, thank you. Um, yes, the question relates to transfer pricing. Um, the pandemic surely has impacted on the global economy and also domestic economy. Um, but the exact effects on a specific economy are, um, are unclear or um, quantifiable and vary um, among economies. Also, the, the, uh, the impacts uh, um, of the pandemic on specific industries and the business uh, will um, vary widely. Uncertainties and changing and changed circumstances as a result of the pandemic uh, will affect the company's uh, um, compliance with the transport pricing rules. Um, but unfortunately, um, the arms length principle in the, the transport pricing system um, does not provide uh, guidance uh, on issues arising from a crisis. And the reliance of the arms length principle on functioning market to provide a benchmark um, for its application is problematic uh, in the crisis. Um, so we probably will see more disputes uh, in the pandemic uh, because an external benchmark uh, used by the company can be now very different uh, from real term um, arms length uh, um, principle used internally uh, to the, um, um, due to the uh, disrupted uh, um, external market. So it will be very difficult to uh, somehow um, to produce, sorry, uh, another thing is, um, it's also very difficult uh, for companies to produce uh, um, comparable data and therefore conduct uh, a comparability analysis uh, in the pandemic. Um, moreover, uh, even if comparable data uh, showing how independent companies were affected um, by the pandemic, uh, um, um, it will not be available. The data will not be available until uh, sometime in 2021. How can we address uh, these challenges? Um, possible solutions should include, uh, I believe, uh, clear government guidance on transfer pricing arrangements relating um, to the pandemic and the ensuing recovery. And this can reduce uh, um, uh, uncertainty and also tax disputes um, for transfer pricing compliance. This is already the case in Australia. And the tax authority here has provided uh, um, clear um, online guidance um, for COVID-19 impacts on transfer pricing um, since uh, June um, this year. And the guidance uh, um, clearly indicates uh, um, to assess the economic, uh, um, uh, economic impacts of the pandemic uh, on taxpayers' transfer pricing arrangements and the tax authority will examine a number of factors, uh, including the function asset uh, and the risk of the Australian entity before and uh, after the pandemic. And the tax authority has also made it clear um, and that comparable company data um, may not be reliable in the short term. And instead, uh, it will consider a detailed uh, um, profit uh, and loss um, analysis to determine the arms length nature of a transfer pricing outcome. Um, a related um, uh, issue for determining an arms length price uh, is the use of an advanced pricing arrangement, IPA. Um, so the, um, the pandemic may force taxpayers uh, to bridge key 
assumptions uh, in an APA, and that the taxpayers uh, uh, have reached with the tax authority. Um, a measure to address such a breach um, is for the taxpayers uh, to proactively engage um, with the tax authority uh, once they have become aware that a breach has occurred or is very likely to occur. Uh, another way to deal with the challenges on transfer pricing compliance for taxpayers uh, is to gather and maintain evidence to support um, and any changes or implications uh, on the business and due to the pandemic. Um, the cooperation uh, between taxpayers and the tax authorities uh, um, can be another useful and important uh, um, measure in addressing transfer pricing issues. Um, as can be seen, um, transfer pricing implementation and the compliance in the pandemic uh, will entail a significant administrative effort and um, extra resource, um, um, resources on both taxpayers and the tax authorities. Um, developed countries such as Australia may be able to handle the issue, um, but I suspect uh, many developing countries uh, would find it uh, difficult uh, to handle uh, due to the lack of financial and human resources uh, in transfer pricing um, administration. Yeah, so yeah, um, I think this uh, somehow is an issue that uh, many uh, developing countries uh, are facing. And, it's a challenging for transfer pricing administration and also compliance. Yeah, that's uh, my answer um, to question four. And thank you. Thank you, Professor Shu. Uh, the fifth question or fifth question relates moves from corporations to individuals. Many countries are thinking of levying, and are going, some of them have already implemented, such as Peru. Uh, uh, wealth tax, okay, on their individuals, both resident and non-resident, okay. Uh, what do you think uh, this uh, levy may may impact the economy as a whole? What this would be an extraordinary measure. Would it would it bring some more fairness to the tax system, or would it be uh, <clears throat> controversial at least, or? Uh, it would create damages to the tax system. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Yeah, um, very good questions. Uh, I would argue um, the question of uh, whether we need to raise uh, taxes uh, to pay for the costs um, should be clarified before proposing um, any taxes. Um, depending on specific countries, um, the answer may be no, um, maybe no um, but the pandemic crisis is likely and to create a large structural deficit uh, for governments um, due to um, pressure to spend more in COVID-19, post-COVID-19 um, for economic recovery. Um, the public pressure, um, um, the public experience of the crisis may also reinforce uh, the design, design for more services, uh, which adds a further revenue pressure on governments. So this suggests and revenue tax revenue will have to be raised and to pay for the costs and ongoing consequences of the crisis. Um, putting aside the political calculations, um, a critical issue is uh, if additional tax revenue is needed, on how it can be raised in the least economically harmful way. Um, crises actually are not new. Um, we have uh, um, our human beings uh, uh, experienced uh, two uh, world wars, and also we have seen a lot of large-scale natural disasters in the past. Um, historically, uh, various tax me measures were used uh, um, by governments uh, to pay for incurred uh, costs. A progressive wealth tax uh, was adopted in Germany, uh, which was very successful in facilitating its post-war economic growth. So this has led some commentators uh, to suggest an imposition of a progressive wealth tax um, in, in, in Europe um, during the pandemic. Uh, the tax can be assessed on the net worth of the top 1% richest individuals, and the revenue can be earmarked uh, to the repayment of uh, funds or euro bonds uh, for the pandemic. I think the rationale behind uh, uh, the idea of a pro progressive wealth tax is that uh, most high-income earners, particularly 
and extremely wealthy have not been significantly impacted by the pandemic and because they can work from home and use their wealth and to withstand market fluctuations. By contrast, low-income earners have been hit the hardest by the pandemic and lockdown. Um, actually, a very recent report, just very briefly shown here, a very recent report found the world's 50 richest people increased their net worth by more than 50% between March and June in 2020 this year. So they gained a lot uh, in the pandemic. And wealth concentration is um, a very serious problem. Um, in our contemporary time, uh, as you can see from, um, from the chart in this slide, the IMF has warned of uh, the, um, terrible, adverse, serious, and the political consequences of wealth concentration in a very small number of individuals. So a progress, progressive wealth tax um, targeting top wealth individuals would generate tax revenue uh, with little or no effect um, on the incentive to invest and uh, innovate. It can also address a dangerous uh, wealth accumulation problem. And introducing such taxes may not be politically difficult um, during the crisis, um, but it needs to be well designed and uh, implemented. Um, so I think as a whole, um, a progressive wealth tax uh, um, can be a possible measure to raise revenue and also to address uh, wealth inequality problems and that exist uh, in many countries. And the point here is uh, and taxes uh, should be part of solutions, but not a part of problems. And taxes can discourage various activities and distort decisions. And some taxes are more economically distortory than others. And the implication is uh, and taxes can be raised uh, with less inefficiency and the distortion, but more um, fairness. Yeah, so that's my brief response um, answer to, um, to the question. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. That's, that was a very interesting viewpoint on this issue. But now, if government, if government were to introduce such measures, how do you think that taxpayer would react, react in general to any potential tax increases resulting from the pandemic. What do you think about? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Yeah, um, um, tough question. I think if any tax is to be introduced uh, or increased as a result of the pandemic, um, the tax should be progressive and to minimize uh, greater income inequality. Uh, worldwide income inequality has come to the fore and during the pandemic. Um, I can share, this is another slide. And this slide shows income inequality, um, uh, which refers to um, Gini coefficient of disposal income. And this slide, the chart shows uh, income inequality changes over the last uh, uh, 100 years. Um, a progressive um, tax with, um, uh, with a high top, um, uh, high top rate on the top 10% wealthiest uh, uh, individuals and um, unchanged or even lowered uh, threshold uh, for the bottom 10% uh, individuals could raise tax revenue and uh, at the same time uh, mitigate serious income disparity. And importantly, um, progressivity um, is a key measure to reduce inequality in income and uh, wealth. And taxes increased in this way would be accepted, I think would be accepted um, by ordinary taxpayers and even those wealthy individuals um, who are likely to be most impacted um, by the tax may feel constrained about uh, raising strong objections and given the heightened uh, uh, opprobrium uh, with which their objections uh, would be met. Um, yeah, so I think um, yeah, there could be um, some possible tax increase, but the increase must be um, uh, must be must be progressive. Uh, I also have listed um, some 
alternative ways. So basically, the alternative, alternative ways uh, uh, refers to measures uh, that the government could consider. Uh, instead of increasing individual income tax rates, um, governments could focus on companies uh, uh, to generate tax revenue. Uh, some business uh, uh, has enjoyed extraordinary abnormal windfall gains um, during the pandemic crisis. Uh, so probably the government can cons consider a one-off uh, ex post windfall tax. Um, such a tax would not be distorting and therefore economically efficient. And the tax uh, levied on profits above for a certain, uh, sorry, above for a normal rate of return um, due to abnormal economic conditions, um, but not a particular effort, um, somehow appears fit. So I think a win for tax or an excess profits tax can be another way uh, for the government uh, to raise uh, um, revenue to pay for the costs of a pandemic. Um, more fundamentally, I think uh, the pandemic could provide a very good opportunity um, for governments to, to think seriously about the reforms uh, of the existing uh, tax systems. It will be a very good opportunity uh, for governments uh, to reduce and uh, eliminate uh, some ha harmful tax uh, um, measures like um, um, exemption of capital gains or, or preferential treatment uh, on, for dividends. Um, importantly, I think we need to consider this uh, fundamental question. What we want the tax system to look like in 10 or 20 years? And the right solution is uh, to make our tax system um, simpler, um, fairer, and more efficient. Yeah, so that's uh, um, my answer to the question. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, so it seems that uh, you are somehow in line with uh, the proposal that Professor Aviona made on our first dialogue of an excess profits tax to, uh, to, to those that uh, have had abnormal um, <clears throat> gains as a result of the pandemic. So yeah. you, you agree with that position, but let's move to our last question, which is uh, so far governments, as, as we said at the beginning, have been either printing money or thinking of increasing taxes. Is there a way to think out of the box to find new solutions other than those two uh, that policymakers could look for? Uh, are, are poorer countries somehow entitled to receive transfers from richer countries? It, 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 what are your views on this point? Is it possible to have to think uh, out of these two alternatives? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for these uh, challenging questions. Um, um, somehow first, a uh, short comment. Why should it require a pandemic uh, to raise, uh, uh, to think out of the box? Um, if the current system for allocating revenue of multinationals is unfair, it's unfair whether or not there is uh, a pandemic. And the pandemic, however, can be a, an opportunity for us and to rethink the basic premises as to how income of multinational companies should be allocated between countries. Um, policymakers need to expand uh, their thinking and to find uh, uh, solutions uh, to helping poor countries. And tax revenue sharing by developed countries uh, with poor countries uh, could help provide much needed funds uh, for poor countries and to deal with the pandemic crisis and, um, and to address the other urgent needs, uh, such as uh, food shortage and the climate change. And the issue is how to justify such revenue sharing and how to incentivize and develop the countries uh, to share, and not least uh, in the post pandemic economic downturn, and how to materialize uh, the revenue sharing. Um, a justification in ethics uh, um, for inter country assistance or poor countries' claims um, probably could be that uh, um, countries have a minimum on humanitarian morality to relieve acute human suffering. At the international level, a multilateral tax system is just if and only if it promotes and protects the human rights of individuals globally. 
So this may imply the international tax system should be reformed um, to achieve for a more um, just uh, revenue allocation um, between developed and the developing countries. And limits should be put on the freedom of countries to pursue um, and maximize their national revenue interests on matters of international taxation. Um, as I just mentioned um, in previous uh, slides, uh, countries have a moral obligation to engage in multilateral um, cooperation. Um, as a matter of fact, assistance from developed countries uh, is not just a concern of, of uh, um, humanity, and it is also um, out of uh, and their self uh, is also out of uh, self interest. Um, the current pandemic and the already green for climate change problem um, mean global crises are not limited um, to only one country. And there are spread over effects will impact all on the planet. Um, so um, developing countries, uh, particularly in those very poor, uh, need to be assured, assured with reliable tax revenue and to provide um, um, uh, necessary health care and social welfare in their countries. Um, yeah, so I think there are, um, we could probably um, think about uh, some mechanism um, for, uh, for revenue assistance or sharing um, by, the, by developing the countries uh, with poor countries. Um, however, relying on developed countries uh, for funding, I don't think it's, uh, it's a long-term solution for developing countries, um, particularly in those at the bottom level. Capacity building, in my view, uh, is more important and can deliver uh, sustainable um, benefits for developing countries. And China is a very good example. The country was extremely poor and did not have any modern income tax um, prior to its economic reform and open um, um, project uh, launched in the late 1970s um, with the assistance of the World Bank and the IMF, IMF and other organizations and the governments. Um, it gradually built up a modern income system and modernized its uh, um, complicated and novel tax system and significantly developed uh, tax administration uh, with adoption of modern information system and made a particular effort uh, to train tax professionals uh, needed by the government. So uh, capacity building, I think is, uh, uh, indeed it is a long um, but a necessary process uh, because the quantity changes uh, will eventually uh, lead to incremental quality improvement. And that's my uh, somehow um, preliminary thoughts um, for uh, the last question. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. If you agree, we would like to introduce a question from, from our audience in this dialogue. The question is the following. What do you think it is possible to regulate tax competition among countries? Um, well, that's a good question. Um, tax competition, I think um, some, the OECD has published uh, a report on harmful tax competition. Um, currently, we still say, sorry, currently we still say um, tax competition. And, and some commentators uh, um, have described uh, tax competition as the race to the bottom competition. We need to re regulate. Um, I, somehow, I, should, I, I think I should say it this way. And tax competition depends on how it is uh, organized is not necessarily a bad thing. In the sense, if tax competition is for the purpose of uh, improving um, tax administration and um, providing better services uh, for taxpayers, I would think, I would say tax competition is a good thing. But if tax competition only drives, um, um, drives down corporate tax rates uh, for attracting um, foreign investment, um, providing preferential treatments uh, um, in order to get more foreign investment, and then tax competition is, is not a good thing. How can we regulate tax competition? This is very difficult because I think it's related to our current international tax system. And if our current international tax system is reshaped 
we probably we could control tax competition um, um, to a certain degree. Um, but at the moment, I still see tax competition um, in many places. Yeah. Okay, so it's basically, it would be um, as long as there is a purpose to 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 decrease taxes, that implies providing uh, services more efficiently. Tax yeah. competition is okay. Otherwise, yeah. uh, if it is just to to uh, to let's uh, if there is no social purpose, so to speak, or uh, uh, the, there should tax competition should be um, in some way discouraged, right? Harmful tax competition. Yeah. Harmful tax competition. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Very good. So I think that we have come to uh, the, the end of our dialogue, Professor. Thank you very much. If you want, you can stop sharing your screen. There is no need to continue um, showing your last slide. <clears throat> uh, we thank you very much for your thoughtful answers to our questions, for your time to, to consider them. Uh, we are uh, preparing for our ninth dialogue next week. It will be at the same tax time, okay? 10 p.m. <clears throat> GMT, which is 9 a.m. In, in Australia. We will have Professor Miranda Stewart from Melbourne, uh, a, a neighbor city of Sydney in, in, in for you, Professor. Uh, and uh, she will be uh, answering the same questions that we have had so far. Uh, until then, we uh, <clears throat> thank you again for uh, uh, watching us and look forward to our look forward to our next dialogue next week, which will be on Thursday. It will not be on Wednesday, it will be Thursday, uh, <clears throat> October, I'm sorry, <coughs> October 22, okay? Uh, and it will be in the morning in Australia. So um, until then, take, take care and wear your masks and stay safe. Thank you very much, Professor Shu. See you next Thank time. Thank you very much. Thank you, bye. bye, -bye.